be, behind my house is a, a pond. And uh, given the fact that uh, my wife and I are the only ones living in our house now, I'm designated as being part of weed control in the pond. And so what I do three or four times a summer is I'll put chemicals in to, that'll keep the weed and algae population down but not hurt the flowers or the fish. And what I'll do as well, in addition to those chemicals, copper sulfate mostly, is uh, I'll take some, uh, it's called aqua shade, and it comes in a gallon, and basically what it is, it's, it's highly concentrated uh, water colorant. So it takes the color of water from whatever color water is to this bright uh, blue, bluish green. My family hates it when I do this because they, they say it makes the water, it makes the pond look nuclear. <laughs> but um, until they help with the weeds, they don't get a vote. And so I think the correct way to do it, according to the instructions, is to put it in one of these things, a dispenser where you put water through it or hook the hose up, or you can use a pressurized container and spread it out over the surface of the pond. Uh, not being uh, long on patience, what normally I do is I take the ca cap off the gallon and I walk along the water and just do this, you know, every few feet. And um, invariably what happens, and it happened this week when I was putting the aqua shade in the pond, you get some on, I get some on my hand. I've, I've used, try to use the same tennis shoes whenever I do this. And there, I now have a set of nuclear tennis shoes and this week I splashed them on my leg and uh, white socks are now kind of dotted. Uh, but then you, you, you try to clean this off. You can't get it off. You scrub and I've used chemicals and used some, some things on this I wouldn't mention here because your kids might try it and try to get that off. Uh, you know, if I could use a steel brush, it wouldn't get it off. Just keep working it and working it and working it. And I thought, how many of us approach our relationship with God like that, where we know in our past that we've got stains? We know very well those stains, and they haunt us. Uh, things that we'd love to forget and maybe can't. Things that we hope that God will forgive us of, but maybe we're not sure. And so when I ask, what's your relationship with God? Maybe all that comes to the surface are your mess-ups, the things where you've really blown it. Or the times you've blown it and you just think, I'm, I should be better than this. I've known Jesus for so long, and yet, why do I keep doing this? And I want to take you to Ephesians chapter 1 this morning, and I hope you'll, it'll give us some hope. Ephesians 1, this is one, we're spending the summer in this one sentence where the Apostle Paul is writing in his explosion of praise as he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. And then he's going to list them. We talked last week about the first blessing, and that's being chosen by God before the foundation of the world. But notice the end of verse number four, that we should be holy and blameless before him. There are two important truths that we should embrace about holiness this morning. First of all, that we all are in need of holiness. When I say holy, I wonder what comes to your mind. Are you thinking of a monastery somewhere? I was reading a book uh, by James White, and he, he talked about connotations of holiness. And he said these are the words that come to mind when he thinks of holiness. Thinness. <laughs> I couldn't be accused of being holy. Thinness, hollow-eyed gauntness, beards, and sandals, and long robes, stone cells, no sex, no jokes, hair shirts, frequent cold baths, fasting, hours of prayer, wild rocky deserts, getting up at 4 a.m., clean fingernails, stained glass, self-humiliation, monastery. Anybody want to sign up? to be holy. Or there was one uh, American journalist in the early part of the 20th century, and he wrote uh, somewhat irreverently of, of the Puritans. He says, a Puritan is somebody who thinks, he's, he's very angry at the fact that somewhere, someone is having fun. <laughs> and being holy means there's no fun. Let's look at this where it says, be 
be holy, that we should be holy and blameless. Let's look at those two words. The word blameless is found in the original eight times in the New Testament, and it, and it means without blemish, like a lamb for sacrifice had to be without blemish, and we are to be without blemish. So how are we doing so far with this? And then he says holy, holy. Holiness, uh, as it relates to God, has two different meanings. Let me describe them, and then let's decide which one of those meanings are meant here when he says that we should be holy. The first one, the meaning is to be set apart, or it's other, to be otherly. In other words, God is set apart. He's far removed from mankind. Years ago, in fact, it was the mid-'80s, I watched a four-part video series by R.C. Sproul on holiness. It was life-changing for me. I picked up the book and read it as well. And then uh, in the early part of the early 90s, we invited R.C. Sproul to do a conference, a Friday night and Saturday conference, and of all the topics that he could do, <clears throat> my request that is he'd, he do, he, that he do the, the topic of holiness. And I, I remember, uh, hopefully till the day I die, those, those lecture series from Friday night till mid to late Saturday afternoon on holiness. And he began by taking us to, to Isaiah chapter 6, where I, the, the Scripture says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I, Isaiah, saw the Lord high and lifted up. To understand that verse, we have to understand Uzziah. Uzziah was the king of Israel, he began to reign at the age of 16. Think about that for a minute. A king at 16. I'm sure he made lots of mistakes, but as he grew and developed, he became a godly king. And he did things that even King David, who was the standard for all kings, couldn't do. He drove out the Philistines, and he sent the Ammonites running. He established and created instruments for war. He reestablished and extended the agricultural base for Israel. He did so much and brought peace to the land in the 52 years he reigned as king. Unfortunately, it didn't end well for King Uzziah. And sometimes, and there's a danger of this for all of us folks, that when we see God use us, there's a danger that somehow we think we were part of it and that we should receive some of the praise. And maybe that was what's going on in his mind the day he walked up the steps to the temple to offer a sacrifice. And thank the Lord there was a godly priest who stopped him. Azariah was his name, and he says, you can't do that. Because the Scripture forbids anybody but priest to offer the sacrifice. And you're a king. You can almost imagine kings don't hear no very often. You all know, almost can, can imagine this picture where King Uzziah, as if to say, do you know who I am? By the way, if, if we ever have to say that, we're already in trouble, aren't we? Do you know who I am, or do you know what I've done? Do you know what I've accomplished? Do you know what I could do to you? And he insisted, and in his fury, and in those moments, leprosy broke out on his forehead. And King Uzziah spent the last 10 years of his reign living in a separate colony outside of the city in embarrassment and shame and in humility because he was lifted up with pride. It was the year that he died, a year of national mourning. And it was in that year that Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. When we see the word Lord in the Old Testament, we often see it in two different ways, either all capitals, when it's all capitals, it's the translation of a, of a Hebrew word, four consonants, in one of two ways, either Yahweh or Jehovah. And it means the self-existent, covenant-keeping God. The second way we see it is a capital L, and then small case letters for the rest of the word. And normally that's a translation for Adonai, which means sovereign one. Isn't it interesting, in the year that King Uzziah died, this great king who had accomplished so much, he said, I saw the sovereign one. And that sovereign one, in contrast to a leper outside of the city, is high and lifted up. With him there is no sin. 
and the train of his robe filled the temple with all of its glory and the seraphim, the angelic beings with six wings. Two they covered their face, two they covered their feet, with two they flew. And they, they sang to each other this song, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And as they sang, the Bible says that the, the, the doorposts and the thresholds just shook because there's such a different uh, distance between man, even a very accomplished man, and a sovereign God. Not to be measured in inches, but in light years. And Isaiah, when he saw the Lord, he saw himself. And not only the thresholds and the doorposts shake, but he shook. And he says, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. When we see the separateness of God, and then we see ourselves, we can only respond in the same way. And yet, to me, it's intriguing that this is Isaiah, a prophet, a prophet of God who wrote the book, Isaiah. He's in the presence of God, and he's saying, I'm undone. You'd expect that from a Zacchaeus. You'd expect it from Matthew, a tax collector. You'd expect it from the, the, the woman of adultery in John chapter 8, or the, the woman of, of John 3 by the, uh, uh, John 4 by the, uh, the, the a psyker, the well, the woman at the well. But here's a prophet in the presence of the other, the one God whose there are no other gods that come close. There's no human being, there's no part of creation that comes close. He's in a category all to himself. And so Isaiah speaks for all of us when he says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Holy, set apart. The second meaning, it, it, the word means whole, that a person is whole or without sin. There's, there's a purity there. <clears throat> when Jesus uh, would find somebody in, in, in his earthly ministry who uh, was uh, sick, uh, blind, he would often heal him and then would use these words, go, your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you whole. So here's our challenge, folks. What is the meaning that it has for us when God says, I've chosen you before the foundation of the world to be holy, set apart, or holy, whole, and pure without sin? Are you ready to vote? <laughs> some will say this, and some will say this, and some will say both. And while there is a sense where we are set apart, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. God is separate and set apart like no human being will ever be or should ever be because God was independent. God is independent and autonomous, not depending upon any human being to exist. Nothing we do changes him. He doesn't need us to exist. We are never to be, by the way, we've made a mistake here oftentimes as Americans and sometimes as Christian Americans because we, we, we tout independence is almost a virtue. We're never meant to be independent from God. So while we're, in one sense, we're set apart, not like God. We're always to be dependent upon Him. And so I think the emphasis when He says, I've chosen you to be holy and set apart uh, and, and blameless is not so much here as it is with the second meaning of the word, that we're to be whole. There's a, the psalmist in the 15th Psalm asked two questions that begin the psalm. The first one is this. He said, um, who, can, who can sojourn in the tent of God? The tent being the tabernacle, uh, the, uh, the, the building, the tent that was used to in indicate the presence of God with the holy of holies, especially in the holy place before the temple was built. Who can just come alongside the temple of God and say, God, I'm here. You want to chat for a while? You don't saunter in 
to the tabernacle of the Most High God. The second question, he said, or who can dwell on his holy hill? And then he gives the answer. And the answer is found in 10 parts. Let me give you a couple of them and just see if you qualify. One who always tells the truth. Check. Do I need to go further? And he lists 10 of those. One who never does evil to his neighbor. One who makes a, a covenant and will do everything to keep that covenant even at his own hurt. And he goes on and on and on. And you read the list and you think, who can? Who can come to his holy hill? And there are many who believe that that psalm is basically with those two questions at the beginning are meant to be rhetorical by saying, no one can come to the holy hill of God. But here's our problem. No one can see God unless they're holy, and yet none of us can, can be holy. We'll die trying to accomplish that list of ten. Here's our problem. Here's the, the, what's behind it. We need holiness because of our sinful nature. David once wrote the psalmist where he said, uh, in sin did my mother conceive me. And he's not talking about her sin. He's talking about the fact that when he was conceived, he was already sinful. The scripture tells us that in, in, in Ephesians chapter, or excuse me, uh, uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. He says, wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men and women, for all have sinned. And so we sin because we have a sinful nature. So we have to be holy, and yet we've got a nature that says we're not. Like, well, which one of you as parents taught your children how to bite each other? Right? You just put your, you open your mouth and you put it over their arm when no one's watching, and then you bite, and then you walk away as if nothing happened. <laughs> Did anybody teach your kids how to do that? No. They just do it. You have to teach them not to do that because of the sinful nature. The second part of this, we need holiness because of our sinful behavior. Uh, the writer of Proverbs, who can say I've kept my heart pure? I am clean without sin. And none of us can say that this morning. By the way, if anybody does say that, I've kept my heart from any sin, they've probably just sinned in saying it. The Apostle Paul probably sums up well. It goes through my mind often in Romans chapter 7, maybe yours too, where he says, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, those are the things I do. So, to see God, to be with him forever, I have to be holy. And yet I've got a sinful nature that won't allow it, and my behavior acts on my sinful nature that just exasperates my problem, and holiness is nowhere within sight. I was reading a book by Mark Buchanan. He reminded me of the story of a, a movie that came out several years ago called The Mission. And it's a story about uh, Mendoza, uh, played by Robert De Niro. And Mendoza is the captain, a very ruthless captain of a group of Spanish slave traders who would go into to these tribal areas of Africa and rip families apart and take men and women and sometimes uh, their children and take them away, put them on their boats, and take them into slavery. Uh, Mendoza made a lot of money uh, through that human trafficking. And then in a jealous rage, he took the life of his brother. And when that happened, he was overcome with his own guilt, and he spiraled into deep shame, knowing that there's no atonement for what he's done. And there was a missionary, played by Jeremy Irons, a man by the name of Gabriel. And so Gabriel sought out Mendoza, and he said, the only way you can cleanse yourself from this is by, by going back to that tribal group of people that you've so uh, abused and spend the rest of your life serving them. Uh, unconvinced that anything could be done to atone for his wrong, he decided to do it anyhow. And he joined this missionary group that was going to make its way into this tribal area. And so he put all of the stuff from his previous life in this netted bag and dragged it along with him, his, his sword and his armor, 
And they went over uh, peaks and went through gorges and uh, went through deep jungles and finally came to the edge. And he's exhausted now, dragging this bag. They come to the edge of a village, this tribal village. The people came out to meet the missionaries so excited until they saw Mendoza. And in the movie, you can just see them. They, they froze in silence. Mendoza, when he saw them and saw the response, exhausted already, knowing that there's no atonement for what he did, he fell to his knees. One of the tribal men approached him with a sharp and curved knife. Mendoza leaned his head, his neck back, as if to say, you do what you have to do. I want this thing over. The man lifted up his knife, the dagger, and he brought it down, but not taking the life of Mendoza, but cutting the cord that held, that was, that held that, that netted bag. And the netted bag of all of his stuff from his previous life tumbled over some rocks down a hill and into the shadows of the jungle. So here we are, needing to be holy. And it's God who cuts the cord. Our lives are preserved. And the second thing I want you to notice this morning, that we obtain holiness through Christ. We obtain our holiness through Christ. I love these words, even as he chose us in him. In Christ or in him are found 164 times in Paul's writings that without those words, there are no blessings. But because of those two words, we have blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing, that we are chosen in him. And he gave us what we could never in a thousand lives earn, and that's holiness. He gave us holiness. Let me describe holiness in, in three different aspects as it relates to our lives. The first one is positional holiness. Positional holiness is the holiness that we receive at the time of our salvation. And by the way, uh, there are some people, maybe you're one of them, who uh, they know they have to come to Christ, but they, they're not ready yet because they've got these stains. So they say, I've just got to clean my life up a little bit. I've got to get rid of some habits. I've got to change my vocabulary a bit because I'm not right yet, ready yet for church crowd. All right? <laughs> You'd be surprised. Okay. I'm not ready for church crowd. Don't waste another minute doing that. We can't clean ourselves up enough. There are no steel brushes and there are no chemicals that can take away the stains in our soul. And Jesus died. And he gave us his holiness by grace. We can't clean ourselves up enough. Just come to him. Bring the bag. All of the guilt, all the things, all the sins, and all the shame. Just bring it and leave it there. And a great exchange happens because God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for all of this and for this. And he, and, and he takes this and he gives us, God gives us the righteousness of Jesus Christ so that when God looks at us from that point on, he doesn't see this. He sees the righteousness of Jesus, who is pure and never sinned. And we always have that, folks. We always have it. So this is called positional holiness. We have this in Jesus Christ, in him. Let me take you to the other end. And this is the day where we see him face to face. The scripture says when we see him, we'll be like him. We don't become as God, but we, 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 have, we no longer have the sinful nature. And we see him, we'll be like him, we'll spend eternity with him, never ever to sin again. Can I get a witness this morning? That's going to be pretty cool. It really is. Never ever to sin again. And so we have the bookends. The time of our salvation, we're given positional holiness. The time where we pass from this life to the next, when we see him, we'll be clothed with the righteousness, the white robes of Jesus, where he, we were placed. We have his righteousness, never to sin again. But in the middle, we have what's called progressive holiness. 
progressive holiness is the life that we live, having the righteousness of Jesus. Nothing can change that. But living this life, still fighting the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so in the course of living, we're going to sin. And when we sin, and by the way, again, if anybody tells you they don't sin, watch out for them. The Apostle John, who was a, a colleague of Jesus in those early years, now it's 60 years after Jesus died on the cross and then rose from the grave and ascended into heaven. 60 years later, the Apostle John, as a man of 90, 95 years of age, writes in 1 John, and he says, and if we sin, 90-year-olds who walk with Jesus all those years can still sin. And so can we. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, a defense attorney, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And so here we are, progressive holiness. It happens with time, and it happens with learning. It happens, and this, while this was a gift, and that's a gift, this is a divine human cooperative where we're, we're to get into the Word, and the Holy Spirit uses that Word to cleanse us and to challenge us and to change us. What I love about progressive holiness is the part that God does. I, I mentioned last week, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue to perform it until Jesus Christ. We're not in this alone. This is not a case of uh, uh, wins and losses. I had a bad day, I had a good day, the devil got to me. I mean, that, then we just pour guilt on ourselves all over again. This is a journey with Christ. We grow and develop. A couple of cautions with regards to progressive holiness. This is what he's talking about. We were chosen before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. Here, there, and here. One of the cautions is about legalism. Legalism uh, is, is man-made rules going beyond the Scriptures. Man-made rules giving the indication that if you live by these rules, you'll be holy. I grew up with this kind of background. Uh, and many of those rules aren't bad, but if, if, they're, if they don't come from Scripture, um, if they claim scriptural authority and there's no scriptural authority, then it's legalism. And, though, and, and, and I, can, I, can have a, I can have a rule that says, um, uh, if I'm going to be, to be holy, you can't eat mushrooms. It's an easy one for me because I hate mushrooms. So I'm going to make that rule. That's okay for me to have that rule and to live by it. But once I demand it on you, that's legalism. Okay, it's, it's it, it, two things. If I make that rule, I'm okay with that unless I claim scriptural authority for that rule. The Bible says don't eat mushrooms, and I don't eat them, and you shouldn't either. Wrong. That's legalism. And what legalism does, that's silly illustration, what legalism does is it, it, it misleads people to think that if they obey these rules, then they're holy. I grew up with it. It didn't make me holy. What it did is it, it, it made me live an outside life that was tailor-made for hypocrisy. Holiness doesn't come from rules. It comes from the Word of God changing a person through the Spirit of God from the inside to the outside. The second thing I want to caution us about, because it's so prevalent today, and that is in the desire for progressive holiness in day-to-day -day living, so much emphasis can be placed on what we do, the performance part of it. And our identity can be, be based on our performance. We did this, we did that, either spiritually or in any other way. Where we say, uh, uh, my value is based on uh, the car I drive. My value is based on the house in which I live. My value is placed on what I've accomplished. And then, folks, when those things go away, what's left? The identity is gone. And that, that leads people to do ridiculous things in order to try to prove who they're worth. Folks, our identity 
is Jesus. We are in Christ. And so for progressive holiness, well, he's given us positional holiness, and we're, we, 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 we're in this endeavor, we pursue holiness. Just as he is holy, we're to be holy. But folks, we, we have to continue to believe in grace and not accept grace as a means of salvation, but then put all the emphasis and work really, really hard. And then we get defeated. And when we get defeated, we beat ourselves up. We beat ourselves up. We say, I, sh- I should be better in this. Why do I continue to do this? Blah, blah, blah. And we forget about the grace of God. And performance isn't part of it. It's by His grace. This truth, where we're chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy, makes me alive, folks. It makes me alive, and it makes me so thankful. It frees me up from all this junk of the past. And if God can forgive me, then I better forgive myself. And as I go through this life, I endeavor not to sin, but if I do, it's not beat up yourself all over again. It's accepting his grace through confession, and he brings forgiveness. So I want to invite you today, if you know Jesus, to thank him today and to worship him and to join the Apostle Paul and all of us at Woodside who say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ, who's made us what we could never be in a thousand lives, holy, acceptable to him. Wow. So be thankful. And let's be alive. And let's worship. May I say as well, if you're on that journey and you have not yet received through Jesus Christ, that positional holiness, and it comes not by work, not by scrubbing. It comes by just say, Lord, here I am. Have mercy upon me, a sinner. And God will, as we confess our sins, and he comes and he gives us the righteousness of Jesus. If that's where you are today, don't spend another minute scrubbing. Just come to him. Bring it all, and he takes it all. And there'll be people at the front here at the close of the service who would love to pray with you about this and introduce you to Jesus or, um, or pray with you about any other thing. But I would love for us now just to pray a prayer together. Are you, are you okay with that? We'll have our eyes open. And it's a prayer of Augustine, one of the early church fathers. The words are coming up on the screen. Let's stand together as we do this. And let's make his words our words today. Let's pray. Breathe in me, O Holy Spirit, that my thoughts may all be holy. Act in me, O Holy Spirit, that my work too may be holy. Draw my heart, O Holy Spirit, that I love but what is holy. Strengthen me, O Holy Spirit, to defend all that is holy. Guard me then, O Holy Spirit, that I always may be holy. Amen and amen.